Welcome to Electrified. It's your host, Dylan Loomis. Quick shout out to my new or updated patrons, Christopher M., Thomas H., Joseph T., and Rand L. Thank you for choosing to support the channel. The Tesla Investor Day live stream is already up. It looks like things will kick off at market close on Wednesday, which is 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. To everybody actually traveling to the event, safe travels. Hope you guys have a wonderful time. On Twitter, Jeff Roberts shared some new images of the grand entrance at Giga Austin, which will hopefully be ready for Wednesday. A friend and patron of the channel, Stephen Bink, has updated his website, teslapricetargets.com. If you haven't checked it out, it'll be below. Some new features where you can plug in your Tesla share count and get some different information. If you plug in your current share count, you can get your current value, the DeBolt ownership stats. This also has the Stevenson indicator and some other stats on Tesla stock. I think the most fun feature though is scrolling down and actually seeing all of the different Tesla stock price targets for the next 12 months from different creators and Wall Street analysts. For what it's worth, my fun and somewhat arbitrary 12 month price target is $315, which puts me right in line with Pierre Farigou at New Street Research, a place I'm happy to be. Just one major word of caution, some of these price targets may not be adjusted for the three for one price split. So Steven, if you're watching, let us know in the comments what we need to know about these targets. Over the weekend, we got a rare aerial view of the Cybertruck actually in motion. I think one of the biggest takeaways is the black tonneau cover. Now, there could be some black glass on top of the Cybertruck as well, but again, it's tough to tell with the reflections and the glare. And when it comes to this light on the front just being one, I of course just think that's a prototype situation, not to be worried about it, whether it's a fog light or something else. What's Inside also shared this video where you can see only one of the rear brake lights in the back was actually lit up. So again, I don't think this has the electrical fully working on this prototype version. In addition, Elon did confirm that this entire light bar across the back will be all lit up, not just these two small lights on the left or right. Naturally, with the darker colored tonneau cover, some people are speculating that this is equipped with solar cells. I think that's pretty unlikely, especially for a prototype version, however, Back in 2019, Elon said there will be an option to add solar power that generates 15 miles per day, maybe more. Would love it to be self-powered. Adding fold-out solar wings would generate 30 to 40 miles per day. Average miles per day in the US is 30. My speculation to me, this feels like an option when production is ramped up to a bit of scale, not something that will come out right out of the gates. We also got this video of the Cybertruck that may not be new, I just personally don't remember seeing it. This one has no side mirrors. Of course, the entire light bar on the back is indeed lit up. And if you look closely right here, you can see that the rear view camera does seem to be digital. Remember though, this is most likely an older video, so be careful with assumptions. Have a look at this chart from Sam Chorus at ARC. In December 2022, 25% of total sales were vehicles with MSRPs over $60,000. In December of 2017, just five years ago, that number was 7.8%. This is only United States data. The blue line is new car models under $25,000. That number has dropped 78% over the past five years. The green line is models over $60,000. That figure is up 163% over the same time. If Tesla is somehow able to offer a mass market EV around $32,000 with a tax credit taking it down to around $25,000, Obviously, this has major implications. Just yesterday on Sunday, Tesla Europe tweeted 4,000 Model Ys have been built at Giga Berlin this week. Let's contextualize this a bit. Back on October 1st last year, Tesla announced 2,000 Model Ys per week. Fast forward about 11 weeks to December 18th, that number had climbed 1,000 per week to 3,000. And just yesterday, another eight weeks after that December 18th announcement, they hit 4,000 per week. If you go back to the summer of last year, Tesla's initial plan was to hit 5,000 per week by the end of 2022. But of course, last year, those plans were pushed back. The adjusted plan was to hit 4,000 per week on March 13th. So Tesla is actually ahead of schedule of the adjusted plans. The new goal for 5,000 a week, which by the way, is the threshold for volume production is the end of June. 
We know the initial capacity for phase one of Berlin is 10,000 model Ys per week, which is 500,000 per year times 50 weeks to allow two weeks for maintenance, downtime, etc. The current production rate, if you annualize this weekly rate with no expected growth is 200,000 model Ys per year. Translating these numbers into financials, every 1,000 units in incremental weekly production is equivalent to an additional $2.75 billion in annual revenue or $770 million in annual profit, assuming 28% gross margins. And yes, the Model Y I'm sitting in has aftermarket interior lighting added. You may recall the third shift at Berlin was added last month, which takes the production to 24 hours a day at Giga Berlin. There are no guarantees, but if Giga Berlin can keep up this pace and add another 1,000 incremental units of production in about eight weeks, that would be two months, taking them to the end of April, which would also be ahead of schedule for their June target. I saw plenty of people with questions about why the Model 3 was selling so poorly relative to the Model Y in January in Germany for the top selling EVs. Just remember that the Model Y is now being produced almost in volume production at Berlin. The Model 3 is still being imported from Shanghai. AKA the Model 3 is still subject to the delivery waves at a higher degree than the Model Y. We also learned today that Tesla now employs more than 10,000 people at Berlin. And remember the goal in phase one is 12,000 employees, so nearing the target. I just want to touch on Chuck Cook's disappointment in the legal wording of this most recent Tesla blog post on the recall for Tesla's FSD beta. I would just say it's legal wording because it's a legal situation and Tesla is trying to appease the regulators. And this fix will just be an over the air software update. As Tesla works on the software, fix, Tesla has paused the rollout of the FSD beta to all who have opted in, but have not yet received a software version containing FSD beta. All that means is if you don't have FSD beta yet, you're not going to get it until this software fix is implemented. But based on online activity, I am seeing plenty of people who already have the FSD beta continue to get software updates. So honestly, I'm not exactly sure what Chuck is disappointed with. Maybe it's the labeling of FSD beta as SAE level two. Of course, Tesla's going to keep doing that as cover and protection for them just so that the driver is always still responsible. Most of you guys know I've always said that these levels are malarkey anyways and have no indication to the actual capability of the system. All this is is regulators ensuring FSD beta follows the rules of the road, like how it handles going through yellow lights and how it actually stops or doesn't at stop signs. Over the weekend, we got a bunch of new pictures and video of some of the latest locations with the brand new Tesla Magic Dock allowing the CCS capability. This list is from discuss.fastcharger. As you can see, there are multiple locations in New York and multiple locations in California. And yes, some of these locations do have all of the stalls already with the Magic Dock. As far as I can tell, most of these upgrades have been to version three stalls. I have not seen any updates to version two. Here's a quick tutorial from Out of Spec Dave. I just tried to authorize it for charging using my CCS Combo 1 adapter, but it doesn't, it doesn't authorize it on the app. It says here that I need to scan, okay, tesla.com, charge your non-Tesla, download the Tesla app. Well, I've already got that. Create an account and sign in. Well, I've already got that. Tap charge your non-Tesla. Oh man. <laughs> you go up to options, scroll across, charge your non-Tesla. No chargers within range. AKA Tesla has not activated or turned on the software side of this feature just yet. So whenever Tesla turns this feature on via the software, the NAX connector will also pull out this CCS adapter for non-Tesla vehicles, but there is one big problem. If that non-Tesla car ends up taking two stations or even worse yet, let's say you got, you got to pull in parallel and, and so you're gonna pull in this way and maybe block three stations. I think things are gonna get ugly here, folks. These cables are going to be way too short for certain vehicles with this CCS charging port in a different location. If you're wondering why New York, do not forget about the Tesla factory in Buffalo where they actually make superchargers and the accompanying equipment. So it's a close location to actually roll out this feature and test the initial rollout. At this point, the Tesla Mexico reporting is just comical. Today, we get this Reuters article that literally just tells us the Mexican president is set to have a phone call with Elon this morning.
A Canadian pension plan that's actually run by the government just bought around 600,000 Tesla shares throughout quarter four, upping the total to 1 million. At the end of the year, the total holding was worth around $118 million. Although the amount is not massive, I do think this is noteworthy because this pension plan is run by the government and it's one of the main pillars of the Canadian retirement program. The Canadian government has had plenty of interaction with Tesla over the past few years, so this is a good sign they like where Tesla is headed. They can't own that much because again, it's a pension fund and they can't get too risky. Today we got S&P Global's annual automotive loyalty awards. In an environment where overall loyalty fell for the third year in a row, Tesla won multiple awards and GM is the winner of the overall loyalty to manufacture while Tesla won the overall loyalty to make. This tracked buying activity for all of 2022. On top of its overall loyalty to make recognition, Tesla scored repeat wins for highest conquest percentage and alternative powertrain loyalty to make. This stemmed from an active return to market consumer base and a majority share of BEV sales. Also though, the brand's resonance with ethnic consumers was a key driver in its recognition of loyalty improvement and diversity retention. Ethnic consumers represented 40% of all personal vehicle registrations last year. So yes, Tesla also won the ethnic market loyalty to make as 52% of its loyal volume came from ethnic consumers. Ethnic buyers have increased their market share in the industry every year for the last decade, making them an important audience in building loyalty success for the foreseeable future. So for the main eight categories, Tesla took down five of them, and these asterisks just note Tesla is a repeat winner for those categories. So to everybody that's been shouting, Elon has ruined Tesla's brand image. That's not at all what the data is saying. In case you missed it last week, Ross Gerber has officially withdrawn his nomination for a seat on the Tesla board of directors. Apparently some Tesla reps have already spoken to Ross and allowed him to voice some concerns and it sounds like they may meet again this week at Investor Day. So Ross seems content that shareholders have been heard. This was a very insightful Wall Street Journal article essentially just saying that all of these new companies announcing gigafactories in the United States are going to have some challenges ramping up production. Some people at Panasonic and industry consultants have said one of the biggest issues is training workers in the finicky art of battery making, where the slightest exposure to moisture might mean a whole batch has to be thrown out. Also, equipment can't necessarily be shipped from Asia and plopped onto an American assembly line because US has different safety regulations and different operating conditions, while equipment customized for the United States is in short supply. When it comes to all of these joint ventures between automakers and battery makers, David Verner, who designs battery facilities for clients in the States, said it's not unusual to encounter a company that has not worked on a major factory building project in the past 15 years. Because of this, the skill set got smaller and smaller and older and older. A Panasonic exec said the company was surprised to find American workers' hands were sometimes too big to efficiently operate machinery made in Asia. It sounds like a joke, but these kind of issues were frequently encountered in the early stages. Basically, training workers without battery experience and adapting equipment and production processes to them is a big challenge. The most recent update, Giga Nevada currently at 38 gigawatt hours of battery capacity annually. Panasonic is also saying that a shortage of workers in the state has led Panasonic to develop its biggest expansion plans elsewhere. The summary, Tesla and Panasonic have already spent years walking through the fire to figure all of this out, while GM, Ford, LG, and SK are all going to have to go through the same learning process. As Sawyer pointed out, if you're in the market for a Model S or X and you're good with hardware three, be sure to check the Tesla website as some of these vehicles may be discounted over $12,000 to clear the inventory in preparation for Hardware 4. A question was posed on Twitter, what stock should Berkshire Hathaway buy with $128 billion in cash? Elon chimed in and said, starts with a T. Clearly talking about Toyota. And Elon throwing salt directly into the wound, probably as he should after some of the crazy comments from Charlie Munger and Tesla and BYD last week, Elon said Munger could have invested in Tesla at a $200 million valuation when I had lunch with him in late 2008. Pierre Fergu put out a good thread on the upcoming Tesla Model 2, whatever you wanna call it. The takeaway is this, Tesla can maintain a gross margin heading toward 30% for autos with Model 2 and FSD both increasing in the mix. 
at a $25,000 MSRP, Model 2 will address 80% of the car market and paves the way for Tesla to exceed 12 million units and $400 billion in auto revenues by 2030. If you want to read the thread, go ahead and pause. But these are all assumptions that we may get more actual information about on Wednesday, so we can revisit this after the fact. Either way though, solid research from Pierre and wanted to highlight it if you missed it. There was a Reddit thread talking about CCS retrofits for the older Tesla vehicles that don't have the required firmware to be able to charge via CCS, so a local service center has said that this may be coming in a few weeks. The amount that Tesla is requesting in tax abatements for the Giga Nevada expansion is now public. The total number $412 million. In return, Tesla will promise to invest in housing, transportation, and childcare for their employees, in addition to investing the $3.5 billion in capital investments. The $412 million in tax abatements can be broken down into these three different categories. If approved, the vote is this Thursday, this would be the third largest assistance package in Nevada's history after the initial $1.3 billion for Tesla and the $750 million for Allegiant Stadium. Of the $3.6 billion Tesla plans to spend on the expansion, $1.6 billion will be for building improvements and $2 billion will be for equipment. Tesla will be working with a childcare provider open seven days per week that aligns with Giga Nevada shifts and employees will get a discounted rate. Tesla will also pilot new carpool options where employees can carpool together with a Tesla vehicle at no cost to them. And Tesla has invested $37.5 million into kindergarten through 12th grade robotics and sustainability programs across Nevada. And to everybody who will complain about Tesla getting funding, Tesla says for every $1 in tax incentives, $10 in economic activity was generated. Regarding the deal back in 2014, Tesla is even more dangerous and powerful now, so they should be able to outdo these numbers. You can find me on Twitter at DylanLoomis22. Please like the video if you did. Hope you all have a wonderful day and a huge thank you to all of my Patreon supporters.